I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And welcome back to Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. Th- this is the beginning of our Jessica Chastain thing. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we started off with a most violent year from 2014. Yeah. Now, kind of a question I have for you. Mm-hmm. I am assuming that because you own the disc, mm-hmm. that this is not your first time seeing this. No, that's my third time seeing this. Yeah. When did you first see it? And what led you to purchase it? Late 2016, and I was thinking about that, and I'm pretty sure I got this when the, the Hastings chain was going out of, out of business. One of my trips up to Boise, I, I think I got this. Or, or it may have even been at the, the Premier Video, which was this other little video store in Boise, that until it went out of business a year or two ago, I would always stop there and get used DVDs because I, I wanted to try to keep it in business as long as possible. Yeah. It was a Ma and Pa video store that opened like 83, and it only closed like in 2018, 2019, yeah. which is a very, very long life for one of those. But I remember hearing about it, obviously, before I bought it, and it is a... So the title of Most Violent Year refers to the year that it's set, which is 1981. In New York. Uh, which in New York was the peak year for, for murders and violent crime. Yeah. And it stars Oscar Isaacs as Abel Morales and Jessica Chastain as his wife, Anna Morales. And they are husband and wife who work in the heating oil industry. Anna Morales's father was in the mob. And they don't spell everything out, but... but Basically, Abel Morales had been a driver because they—he's talking. They mentioned when we were drivers to one of these other yeah. characters in the film, who married the boss's daughter and was very ambitious, and made a go at it. And this this business is thriving. They just bought a new mansion. This is Long Island, I guess. Don't, yeah, I don't know my, don't know my bur- boroughs or the Greater New York I, area I that much detail. That. Where would this house be located in the New York yeah. area? But this business is about ready to expand. There's some old Hasidic Jews that own an abandoned port port and tank facility next door that they've been sitting on for years and are finally willing to sell. And so he's having to put together money to buy it because once he gets this, he's kind of set. He becomes a big deal. He goes from kind of the, the middle the middle league into a major league uh, oil uh, heating oil provider. But somebody keeps hijacking their trucks and stealing oil, and the drivers are getting nervous, and the Teamsters leader... Well, and the drivers are getting beat They're getting beat up, when yeah. These, ...when these get hijacked. And the Teamsters... It's not simply throw them out of the truck and drive away. They're beaten. Them. Yeah. The Teamsters leader, or rep, is trying to get him to agree to let them carry guns, but Abel's not willing to do that yet because... He's not willing to do it, period. Period. And and part of the reason why is because he's trying really hard to differentiate himself from, from the, the mob background of the business. And he's under investigation by Assistant District Attorney D.A. Lawrence, played by David Aleo. Yeah, I don't know how who, to pronounce that. Who uh, was Martin Luther King in the Selma movie. Oh, okay. And he's he's ambitious, too. And he, he's kind of tasked with policing the heating oil industry. It seems like any any industry that's kind of like essential, like sewage and dry cleaning, you know, these are the different industries you see in mob movies that they kind of take them over because you have to have these industries. Yeah. And so he's supposed to be policing it. And so he's got this kind of interesting relationship with Abel because I think he knows that he's mostly clean. But he also knows that he could be beneficial to him if he kind of puts the screws on politically. And so they're kind of having this dance, and they've got this 30-day period after his down payment to the Hasidic Jews where he has to pay the rest of the 1.5 and change million dollars. That's the remainder. So I was actually thinking about that because he says he puts 40% down and the remainder is 1.5. Yeah. So he must have put down in the neighborhood of 1.2, 1.3 million in cash yeah. as the deposit. And yeah. He has 30 days to close on to secure the rest and, and close on the property. So this is around a 2.5 million dollar purchase altogether. Yeah, in ni- over, 1981 yeah. money. Yeah, and it's this movie is the story of pressure coming down on him. He's trying to make this thing happen. And he's being squeezed on all sides. The bank eventually gets to be kind of maybe the bank's going to 
going to back out and because of circumstances be, with one of yeah, his drivers and and he's got his competitors that he doesn't entirely trust all of them yeah and it's just a, a powder keg of a film that starts out good but kind of slow and then builds and then the pressure and the tension just build and build and build well this film it maintains pressure this this movie is very slow uh, throughout the majority of it but despite being slow, it maintains the pressure. Mm. You, or at least I, had a consistent feeling of anxiety watching yeah. this. Even though the t- the pace was slow, and at times you're like, okay, come on, you know, but mm. it's it's very consistent with that pressure. It pays off, because because it it, it, it gets faster and faster as, as it gets towards the end. It has yep. that, that wonderful chase sequence at the end that's a part car, part foot chase that ends up on an L train. Which is very evocative of a similar sequence in the French Connection. That's an awesome sequence. Yeah. Uh, another thing I liked about this film is the way it the shot. There's a lot of scenes, kind of wide shots of rooms with the light kind of fading, and you, you can almost feel the dust in the air. And there, there's segments of the music that are very evocative, and I'm going to completely butcher the name of this movie. Kayo. Kaiomatsu oh, is completely wrong. It's 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 a film from the early '80s that's basically just shots of nature, and eventually it's shots of industrial society and the way it's screwing over nature. And it also has uh, this kind of the momentum's getting faster and faster and faster, and this isn't going to end well. And part of the music here is basically doing the Philip Glass bit that that scores that is a Philip Glass score is very famous. Yeah. And there are certain segments that it's clear that that's that's what they're evoking now i reread my review that i wrote about this on my personal blog back in december 2016 and it reminded me of something that i'm not positive would have been re-evoked for me if i hadn't read the review first so okay. i liken this i said there's one movie that this reminds me of the most which is really nothing like it in the exterior parts of it the story or the setting or anything but yet is the thing that it reminds me of can you guess what that movie would be? It's not any of the surface details. It's it's the it's the building. It's the sense of building towards something violent. The only thing that jumps to mind is The Godfather, but I know that's not going to be the answer. That's not the answer. But there is some Godfather in this. Yeah. There will be blood. Okay, yeah. Because that's a, because and like that this title Most Violent Year, it tells you early on you're going to have blood. You're going to have violence. And it takes a long, long, long time to get there. Yeah. But you can feel it building, and you're just waiting it for it to happen. It does happen here, not in the way you were probably expecting, but in a way that was absolutely set up from the very first minutes of the movie. I have been talking at length. What are some, uh, some thoughts or observations you have about this? One of the things that stands out to me about this movie is Oscar Isaac's character... Abel Morales, he's very consistent in this film in his re- refusal to accept certain levels of violence, which stands out in the midst of this most violent year, mm-hmm. you know, or a violent year. Yeah, it stands out, and I, I wonder how intentional that was. And and we're we're gonna jump into the director in a, in a couple minutes, but you wonder how intentional that is because there's really only one point in this movie where he. Resorts to, the line. to tra- traditional violence mm-hmm. and gets close to that line, and even then you see like this moment. You know, it's that it's it's after that train chase. Yeah, and he's got the guy on the ground. He's been pistol whipping him. He's got the gun, the the hammer cocked, his finger on the trigger. He's got it pressed in the guy's eye. He's and trying can, to get him to say, "Who are you working for?" Well, but for? he can. You can see in his face. There's this moment of, "I'm just not this guy." Yeah, and it kind of happens quick and kind of subtly. But it's clear in his decision making, like he has, you know, he doesn't have to shoot the guy. He could continue to be violent to the guy and beat him for whatever details he wants or leave him in a puddle on on the sidewalk or whatever. And instead, he chooses to let the guy go. Yeah. And as the guy was getting up, I wondered if he'd kick him, you know, something like that. He consistently chooses the less violent route. Like even when there's the burglar at their house, he chases him with the bat. Uh-huh. And I don't doubt if he'd caught him, he'd hit him once or twice, but 
he wasn't the guy that's going to resort, resort to the guns, especially in the midst of this year in New York. Well, he sums that up in his conversation at the end with the district attorney talking about how he always tries to go for the, the most right the decision. most right way yeah. yeah it's like that the the goal is never questioned to me and what that is the question is what, what route what path do i take to get there and i always choose the most right path she's basically saying yeah there's some compromise but to get where i want to go i'm going to go there in the most righteous way that i can get there well and it kind of works out for him because like when he lets this this guy that was hijacking his load so to clarify that that are hijacking the load, he's chasing them. They rolled the tanker truck over. One of the two guys involved in in hijacking the tanker truck is killed in the in the rollover. The other guy's fleeing. He chases him down, and chooses to let him go. I mean, he's he's got all sorts of control over this individual, mm. and because he lets him go, the guy tells him, he says, you know, I don't work for anybody, but here's where we where we took your fuel. Mm. So he's able to go and use this to his advantage. To get to his end goal, mm. you know, against one of his competitors, uh-huh. and that's interesting in the terms of that character study. I'm not yet sure how much I appreciate that. Mm. I like the way that he handled certain decisions, you know, and you know the way he handled his competitor who bought the fuel, mm. you know, and all that type of stuff. Those those aspects were really good. It also stands out to me that this is more the Oscar Isaac film than mm. the Jessica Chastain it is, film. It is as this is Jessica Chastain month, the the thoughts that stand out to me about Jessica Chastain in this film, Jessica Chastain, she has a certain level of versatility. Mm. Like you look at a movie like zero dark 30 that we're going to talk about later this month. She does nothing to really flaunt or accentuate her physical characteristics. Mm. And yet in this movie, she clearly does. Yeah, Yeah. She's, she's got a certain level of versatility she doesn't necessarily have the innocence of an Amy Adams. Yeah, yeah. Or at least we haven't seen that demonstrated in a lot of her films. But she, she certainly is a, a capable and versatile actress who can play a lot of different types of roles. Yeah. This is a great character for her. Before we started recording, I, I shared kind of my bit of trivia for, for this film. That So this came out in 2014. So it was probably filmed in 2013. And... Jessica Chastain really kind of came on the scene with her supporting role in The Help in 2010, and all of a sudden she was in everything. So she was established at the time this film came out. Oscar Isaac was not. So she was cast first, and then she suggested to the producers, uh, when I was in acting school, I want to say Juilliard, is this guy Oscar Isaac, who I think would be perfect for this part. He's a couple years younger than me. You should, you should bring him in. And so they did, and they realized this is the right guy play our, our lead character and i just i kind of i like that i like that little detail that she brought him in yeah. and of course this was around the same time as the coen brothers film inside Llewellyn davis and these two films together kind of established oscar isaac as person to watch and then his career has has just grown since then you know who he kind of reminds me of is joaquin phoenix particularly in we own the night okay don't know if that rings any bells for you. But I'm, yeah, I'm not positive I've seen that. I doesn't. I know the name. Yeah. It kind of there's things about those two characters yeah. that seem reminiscent. There's also to me, a little but... Michael Corleone in yeah. here because he he wanted to go straight and they kept on bringing him in, and so he he I mean he finds himself to be under pressure, really a natural gangster if he wanted to be that, yeah. that he can organize these things. Qu- quick he, but he, he keeps can, resisting but that. he keeps resisting he doesn't want to be that yeah and he's more successful at choosing the most right way than michael was for sure do you know much about the director of this film not a lot he has not done a lot either he's done a few things it's jc chandor is the is the director i'm familiar with he he's largely a writer but all is lost that he wrote that isn't an excellent film. You still need to see I that, right? See that. Mm-hmm. Triple Frontier, which was is a Netflix film, which is eh, he also was a writer on. I want to go find his directorial credits. Uh, he directed Triple Frontier, Margin Call. And he also Lost. directed All Is Lost. Mm-hmm. My esteem for him went up on the basis solely of All Is Lost. All Is Lost, I was skeptical of. 
and it was one of the best films I'd seen in a while. You know, I've not seen any of his other films. I probably should because I, I appreciated this one so much. I've heard of all of Margin Call. Yeah. I'm not super familiar with it. All is Lost is good. Triple Frontier is eh, yeah. so so. You can see what he was trying to do, but it's you know, sometimes Netflix films are you know, major yeah, hits and, and sometimes they're yeah. like this was it's a Netflix eighty percent good, you know, mm-hmm. and Triple Frontier is one of those, but yeah, it seems like he's done more writing than he has directing, but it seems like he also directs some of what he writes. Yeah. A supporting cast, they're consistently good. They're not generally names that you would really recognize. The other person who you would would be Albert Brooks as the, the right-hand man for Abel. Yeah, Andrew Walsh. He's, he's good, and he's not overly Albert Brooks. Albert Brooks is kind of a strong concentrate of a persona. And that's underplayed here. He's, he's really good as, as the number two. And I love at the end, because they're able to get out... You know, spoilers. They're able to get out of uh, some of this situation by appealing to some money that his wife has been stealing off of the books for years. And he asked his, his assistant, or his right-hand man, did you know? And he's like, yeah. Yeah, he's I like, know. You should have told me. I was like, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So it's like it like evokes. There's this entire backstory about how he stumbled on it, and you know that she swore to secrecy. You yeah. can't tell my husband. It's like, oh, okay. well, she her her logic for it, while it's not great, if I could see if she explained it to that character, well, her, he'd, he'd be like, eh. her father was a mobster, yeah, and they're not super clear, but he might well be in jail, and so I think there was she grew up knowing you have to have an exit strategy. And so she, she, even though she, even though this is a pretty strong marriage, they're they're still out for each other. They 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 make a point of that, and I like that they both work in the business. Yeah, that she's heavily, obviously, involved in the accounting. I liked this couple, yeah, quite a bit. And then they have two children who are kind of peripherally in 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 the film. So you've seen this three times. What mm-hmm. is your overall opinion of this film? This is a great movie. And this was, I want to say, the National Board of Review's best film of 2014. Really? Huh. It was a Golden Globe nominee for Best Performance by an Actress in a Supporting Role for Jessica Chastain. But that's probably its biggest award nominee. Award feels nomination. Like it, sh- it, it feels like the kind of film that should have gotten a lot of awards. feels like it should have gotten more awards. I'm not sure why it didn't. It's um, very evocative. Um, the, the, the other film that we've discussed on this podcast that kind of evokes the same era, of course, was Joker. It's very much New York in 1981, and it reminds me of like a Sidney Lament film, like Dog Day Afternoon or Norman Jewison and Justice for All. This late 70s, early 80s kind of serious filmmaking. And of course, The French Connection yeah. because of the, the chase sequence. Yeah, do you know much about how this did in the box office? It did. It was a disappointment. I had no clue coming into this, but I just was glancing had a estimated twenty million dollar budget. Interestingly, its opening weekend is given in French, in francs. Okay. So it had an opening weekend of just over one million dollars. Uh, nice its its domestic gross it says was five point seven million dollars, and its worldwide gross was a mere just over twelve million. Yeah, off a twenty million budget. Yeah. So, lost money. Yeah. I'm sure it made the money later on. Yeah, I'm sure it at least broke even on its. Could- Streaming or DVDs. And this is a good film. This should have this should have done better. I don't know if it was the advertising or just because the stars weren't the, then the stars they are now. But it is a really good movie. Yeah. It's it's definitely a solid movie. I, I guess let's go ahead and jump into ratings. How would you rate this film? This is four stars and nine out of ten. You like this a little bit more than me. The pace for me holds this back a little bit. Again, it maintains that sense of tension throughout, but the, 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 the tempo just was a little too slow, and it, it took some of that early development was left me going, okay, what's, you know, which is part of what works for it, yeah. not knowing what's happening in the beginning, but it's also, I can see how it turned off a few people. For me, I'd say this is three and eight. Three, mm. three stars on the four-star scale and eight on the ten-star really? scale. Three, not yeah. three and a half? Well, I mean, I try to stick to the whole stars, but yeah, I could go three and a half. Yeah, I mean, eight stars is, you know. When I was watching this, and it's been probably three or so years since I've seen it, 
I was like, this isn't quite as good as I remember. The first half of the film, I, I would probably give three and a half because it's, it's pretty solid and smart, but it's a little slow. But that last half, the last half to last third, just really, really works on all yeah, cylinders. Yeah, the way it wraps up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It definitely wraps up quite strong. Yeah. One other quick tangent on this film. Okay. First time you're watching this movie, mm. when they hit the deer. Jumped. Now, what about when the gun goes off? Yes, that did is crazy. Did you think that it was a, like something else, or did you think it was the wife? Um, no, I th- I can't remember, but that that's a good I was moment. like, holy crap, did someone just capitalize on this deer to like hit the family? Yeah, like- well, that's a great moment because it, 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 it talks about this relationship where she, it seems like she's the stronger one because they hit this deer. Or at least deer. more willing to resort to violence. Yeah, so they hit this deer while driving back from, from a dinner, and it's in pain you gotta you gotta put the deer out, out of the misery and so he's getting ready to beat it Club with a tire, tire iron and Jessica Chastain pulls up a gun and shoots it startles her husband well but she sneaks like not sneaks but she walks up behind him and he as he's getting ready to hit it with the tire iron mm-hmm. you don't hear her approach and all of a sudden the gun goes off and this is established earlier because uh, there was somebody that tried to break into their house and then later the little the youngest daughter found the gun that he dropped in and the was bushes. playing with it when it was loaded. And so Jessica Chastain goes to her husband and is like, you got to keep us safe. you got to keep us safe or I'll do it. You don't yep. want me involved. And so this was her basic declaration of, yes, I have a gun. And they go home and they have this kind of awkward conversation. And, and Well, and he takes the gun from yeah. her. And Abel's like, no guns. It's like, I don't want anything that makes us look like freaking monsters. Yeah. And, yeah, and and in the end, he's he's as strong as her, or stronger. And this... But in uh, a different this, way. In a different way, yeah. This is, he's, he's, they're, both, they're both very smart. They're both kind of sly, but he's sly in a more subtle way. Yeah. Whereas she's in the more traditional brute force mm-hmm. kind of sense. Yeah. Traditional gangster sense, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, this was a good film. This was a solid film. I'm glad I've seen this film now. Yeah. Not one I'll go out of my way to be watching on a regular basis. Yeah. But definitely glad I saw this film and got caught up on it. So, yeah, yeah, this was my first time. So, very good. Much else to say on this? No, I think we've covered our bases. Okay. I'm Rob. I'm Nate. This is Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. I never even pulled up any trivia. I don't know if there's any good ones. I guess Javier Bardem was at one point cast in the lead role. Then he dropped out. Yeah. And then Jessica Which Chastain is when Jessica Chastain, Chastain, as you talked about. Yeah. I'm glad it didn't end up with. I like Javier Bardem fine. I think it would have not worked it, it nearly as well. It needed to be somebody who, who. I mean, you look at Bardem and you're like, yeah, of course he's a killer. It needed to be somebody s- suaver. Yeah. Or somebody who just looked. Fa- I mean, he, he rocks that jacket. Yeah, he wears throughout the day, and he just looks all, you know, slick back. And I don't think Bardem could have done that quite as well. Yeah, I guess Charlize Theron passed on the role that Jessica Chastain plays. That would be a little bit different too. That would have been a different movie. Yeah, would have been more like uh, Reindeer Games. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it would have had more of that feeling. But yeah, another tangent for you. Okay. I found out yesterday. Yesterday was the first time my brother Jacob ever watched Saving Private Ryan. Oh, really? I'm like, how the hell did you make it to 30 and never saw what Saving Private Ryan? What occasion did that? It's on Netflix and it's going away at the end oh, of the Oh, okay, month. yeah, yeah. So it was one of those expiring titles and he's like, well, I better watch it. So he like, he knew he needed to set aside time to like focus and devote to the film mm-hmm. for his first viewing. But yeah, he watched it last night for the first time, so. And then he yeah. talked to you about it pretty quick thereafter. He texted me earlier in the day that mm-hmm. he was going to be watching it. So I was sending him some stuff earlier in the day that didn't c- contain spoilers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and then yeah. The Nazis lost! Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite lines from Band of Brothers is uh, Did you guys hear that? Evidently, the Germans are bad. <laughs> 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 Do you remember that scene? Vaguely. Yeah. My all time favorite um, line from the movie. Are you ready? All right. Can you, do you have any guesses? No. Remember, boys, flies spread disease, so keep yours closed. <laughs> yep. That's my all time favorite line from that series. Yep. So we're talking about church memories, and I have this memory when I was probably about four or five. I'm in Sunday school, and I remember it was a husband wife te- teacher. And they were teaching about the three degrees. Which was common, really common when we were kids. Really common at the time, yeah. Not so common now. Yeah. 
So they're talking about three degrees of glory, which is you know, LDS, standard LDS doctrine, but I'm just a little kid, so most of what I know about afterlife is from cartoons. So I'm really interested to have this additional information, so I'm paying attention. So after church, when we're in the car going home, and my mom's asking what we learned, I said, well, we learned about three, three kingdoms of heaven today. And she's like, well, which one of those do you want to go into? I'm like, I was thinking maybe the middle one. <laughs> and she's like, no, you want to go to the celestial game. You want to go to the house? Okay, okay, okay. But honestly, this has always been a theological problem with me. It's like, if you're going to have a great graduated heaven, suburban... Not everyone's going to make it. Not everybody's supposed to. And, and, and say anybody that does make it to the highest degree of the highest one is a failure. That doesn't seem... That's not the way I'd do it. Yeah. Because it's like you could be a wonderful man who's an accountant from Pocatello or who's you know a businessman in in Sandy, but you don't belong in the same degree of heaven as Albert Schweitzer. You just don't. <laughs> Were you holding back the Albert Schweitzer? Well, Albert Schweitzer is my go-to example when I have to make that point. <laughs> Maybe do you have Albert Schweitzer, <laughs> Albert Schweitzer in my be, back pocket? Is a go-to. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> but the I, highest I degree seemed like an awful lot of work to five-year-old me. I'm like, I'll be fine with the middle. <laughs> now I'm I'm interested in where more of these memories take you. <laughs> <laughs> I, sh I should where, I should see that? I should write that, a book. Where did this come up? Oh, somebody on Facebook had had posted a thing about sharing your first church memory. Uh -huh. And so that got me thinking about it, and which of course was not the memory I just gave. Yeah. The the first church memory that I had was I was probably about three or four, and my brother would have been just a baby. And so my my dad's up on the stand for some reason. I I can't remember why. He may have been giving a talk, or I think he was a clerk, so he may have been up there to count the the attendance. And my mom couldn't handle me and the baby. So when I was being answered, just go up and sit by your father. So I went up and sat with my dad for a while. Got bored, went, went back down, sat with my mom. Got bored, went back up and down. I'm surprised that your dad let you go or that your mom didn't give him a signal to just hang on to you. You know, I, a lot of the details are, are, are very fuzzy. Yeah. But I remember going back and forth multiple times. Yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I got spanked for that. <laughs> He's like, it probably punished me for that so that I don't do it again. Because... Well, it would be too tempting. I told you I had a similar memory, but it was my dad was bishop, so we'd go up the last... It was before the closing hymn. Like it was, I want to say it was during the last speaker mm -hmm. that whoever was well-behaved would get to go and sit with dad. And one of his counselors would put pennies in our penny loafers. and But we would stay with dad through the conclusion of sacrament meeting. I have no memory of what happened at the conclusion of sacrament meeting. I just remember we'd stay with dad through the, you know, whatever was left of the closing speaker, the closing mm. hymn, and through the closing prayer. And then I have no memory of it. Like, yeah. my memory of this experience, like, it's just, yeah. you know. It, but, yeah, I, I have similar memories of going. But it was a regular occurrence for us because my dad was a bishop, yeah. you know. And, yeah, so he was up there every week. And, yeah. yeah. Fun. It's quality outtake. It's going to make for a long outtake. Yeah, we just made outtake. our episode longer. Yeah. <laughs> Forget this uh, short episode yeah. crap we were talking about. And this month is the beginning of our Not Amy Adams. Yeah. Bleep. Our, this is the beginning of our Jessica Chastain month. Oh, I thought we were doing Isla Fisher. <laughs> no. <laughs> Bleep. <laughs> <laughs> This is going to make for fun editing. Uh, 